Hi my friends and welcome to my channel. My name is Lucas. Today I am going to talk about Beat von Murald's critical admiration of England. This is a working title of a larger project that analyzes Anglo-Swiss friendships in the 17th and 18th century. So Beat von Murald's critical admiration of England. Keep that in mind. Admiration of England. We are going to have a look at some excerpts taken from Beate Murald's Lettres sur les Anglais et sur les Français et sur les Voyages. I have translated them myself. We're going to have a look at them shortly. But before that, I'm going to briefly introduce Beate von Murald. The name of his book, Lettres sur les Anglais et les Français, immediately tells you that it's going to be a comparison between the English and the French. But what we are going to do, we are only going to focus on excerpts taken from the Lettres sur les Anglais, as it's the Anglo-Swiss relationship that we are interested in. So an Englishman who travels to England, who has got this external view on England. That's what we are interested in. And not that much of French, although the French and the Catholic other are always important to the comparison between the Swiss and the English. And then, of course, admiration. There's lots of admiration here. Who was Beat von Murald? A concise introduction. Beat von Murald was born in 1665 in Bern, Switzerland. Bern, Zurich, Lausanne, Geneva, Baal were the bastions of Protestantism in what is Switzerland today. Beat von Murald was a descendant of the Protestant Muralto family of Locarno. Locarno is in the Italian speaking part, is Italian speaking region of Switzerland. He was a Swiss humanist and patriotic reformer, a perspicacious travel writer who focuses on people and not on mon monuments. As you might know, in the 17th, in the 18th and even at the beginning of the 19th century, the grand tourists, i.e. the youth, the wealthy young people, young students who travelled from Britain to the continent, focused mainly on monuments and ignored people. The only thing they were interested in were women. So they did not really focus on people and what they were like. They were there to go through their list and tick off one monument after the other and have fun with girls, drink alcohol and some wanted to indulge in homoeroticism. So this was what happened. He's very different. He goes to England. So it's kind of a reverse grand tour. He travels from Switzerland to England and up from England to the continent. And he focused on people. This is the time when you've got this external view in literature, but more in fiction than in travel writing. Think, for example, of Montesquieu, Les Lettres Persanes, the Persian letters, where you've got these travellers arriving from Persia and criticising France. This is not really what Mural does. He does exist, he's a travel writer, and he's not necessarily that critical. He is pretty positive about anyone Protestant and more critical about the Catholic other. So he, we could say that he is a sui generis tourist on a reversed grand tour. Reversed because going in the opposite direction from the continent to Great Britain. He was one of the first scholars of Englishness and Anglomania. So nowadays, there's many scholars who focus on Englishness. He was the first scholar of Englishness. He really traveled there and analyzed what are the English like? What is Englishness? He is one of the first promoters also of the myth of a pure and moral Switzerland, 
who travels abroad. Later on, of course, we've got Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who was very much inspired by von Mouald, who also promoted Euro Switzerland, as you might know, even in England, because he travelled to England. Lots of people ignore that. That's where he wrote Les Confessions, the Confessions, in England, not in Switzerland. So, OK, very important, this idea of Euro Switzerland that became very important then in the 18th century. Unfortunately, Pierre von Mouald is forgotten nowadays, but he's ever so important if you really want to understand Jean-Jacques Rousseau, if you want to study Englishness, if you want to understand Brexit and why Switzerland is not in the European Union and the UK has left the European Union. For all this, you need to study Beat von Mouald. OK, so further, he was an advocate of simplicity, frugality and pietism. Simplicity and frugality characterise the writings of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. There again, you see. Um, the downfall of a country, according to Mouralt, is always linked to imminent vice, i.e. vicious behaviour is the reason for a country's defeat. This again is very, very modern very modern for the end of the 17th century. Only in the beginning of the 18th century in Holland, they believed that vice was related to defeat. And <clears throat> they persecuted homosexuals in Holland. They actually um, persecuted and hung them because they thought that if this vice was not punished and eradicated, they would go down. And as they were not very successful anymore in the wars, they thought that the homosexuals were to blame for that. In, in England at that time, vice was not yet linked to, um, <clears throat> to the downfall of a country that much. That would only then happen with the Protestant king, George I, who came from Hanover over to England. A German king, really, yeah, who was also very close to, to the Dutch, um, the Dutch traditions. If you think that he bought gin with himself, yeah. So very important this this concept elab elaborated by Murat, yeah. I mean, this is this very very important to understand to understand um, England. Murat was looking for common ground between Protestant England and Protestant Switzerland. So that is what he did. He look, always looked for common ground. And he's remembered, not by many, unfortunately, as the author of the Lettres sur les Anglais et les Français et sur les Voyages. So comparison of the English and the French, but also what is traveling? Is it going from A to B? Or is it more a journey? That was very important. In, he questioned that. And why would people just admire monuments, historical monuments, modern monuments, and not the actual people, their habits, their clothes, what kind of food they ate, what their cuisine was like? We can say that Lettres sur les Anglais, les Français et sur les Voyages is an apology of the English people who killed one king and then chased another. OK, this was a very concise introduction. I hope that it was helpful. Now we're going to have a look at the excerpts. I have translated these excerpts for you and they build a together, which is a portrait of the English. As I said before, we only are going to focus on Les Lettres sur les Anglais the letters on the English, not on England, on the English, yeah, because he was not interested that much in monuments, very important. He, in fact, said, enseigner, c'est répéter, to teach is to repeat, so I'm being repetitive in his honour. First excerpt, while I am in England, I want to tell you, sir, something about the manners and character of the English, as much for fun as for my serious intention to portray this nation and hence to make it well known to you. He's going to portray England. And here, what also is very important, and he's going to write 
something about the manners and character of the English. For fun, of course, but also to teach his serious intentions with docere et delectare, which in the 17th century was very, very important for any teacher. On the left side, you've got admittedly a bit of an out of context uh, caricature here by James Gilray and it's John Bull taking a luncheon. You see here John Bull sitting at his table with Admiral Nelson's out of context, of course, because this is the 18th and not the 17th century, so I shouldn't have done that, yeah? But I'm just such a fan of James, Gil James Gilray, really love him. And John Bull is going to be very important here because the stock character John Bull was very important also in the 17th century. And we're going to look a bit at the compar a comparison between Wilhelm Tell, the Swiss stock type, a mythical character, and we could say an English metonymy, John Bull, also stock type, also mythical. An English William, William Tell. So, out of context, but just an amazing, 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 amazing caricature here. And here, of course, you've got Nelson and you've got the boats. Napoleon is involved, so sorry about that. Yeah, but just, just enjoy and forget it. It's out of context, please. Prosperity, magnificence and abundance. The ways for which the English are mainly known for are the ones that we are going to experience when we visit them. Prosperity and magnificence among the rich and abundance among the lower orders. So we've got prosperity and magnificence and they're not some poverty or no, abundance among the lower orders. Very, very positive judgment here. Prosperity and magnificence, magnificence, and then abundance. It's nearly an oxymoron, abundance and lower orders in 17th century. Well, even nowadays, if you look at most of us here in this planet, lower orders around the world and abundance, it's not many countries where that still exists, yeah? Okay, let's have a look at the second part. Here, the lower orders are in general well dressed. And we can see that here in a portrait, again, by James Gilray, again in the 18th century. But you see how they were generally well dressed, all of them. Here, the lower orders are in general well dressed. And this is proof enough for their well-being, as in England, clothes are less important than food. Surprising a bit, it has got such a bad name. But we're going to see together that in the 17th and then the 18th century, English food was the best food in the world. And we're going to see how abundant it was and what kind of food they ate and how this is related to John Paul. So here, the lower orders are in general well-dressed. 18th century travel writers who travelled from England to Switzerland, John Moore, William Cox, um, Helen Maria Williams, they all were impressed about Swiss clo clothing and cloth and how the farmers were well-clothed in the end at the end of the 17th century and the beginning of the 18th century in Switzerland. Further, the lower orders do not need a particular description as they mix and mingle with the upper classes. The lower classes love the same diversions as the rest of the upper classes, the merchants and the priests. They all have the same virtues and suffer from the same vices. So, they all mix and mingle. This is important here. And also that he admits that in a Protestant country like England, 
people indulge in vices. And we're going to have a look at what vices we had. I hope that you're not going to be shocked. The myth of liberty and impunity. A myth, really, eh? Because, of course, liberty... Was there really liberty in Switzerland, in England, at the end of the 17th century? I'm not too sure. And here we've got another portrait by another one of my favourite ones, Thomas Rowlandson, Portsmouth. You might know this place, Spice Island, still exists nowadays. And there's still two amazing pubs there, Spice Island in Portsmouth. Go there, go have a look for yourself and enjoy ships going by at Spice Island in Portsmouth but I would love to be there at the end of the 17th century with all those ships and rum and have to admit the women upstairs in the pub say eh? they're missing nowadays well I'm joking maybe not in general they are poorly educated they are the English of course because he's talking about the English oh 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 poorly educated put that in red because he's going to contradict himself later on in fact they were not poorly educated don't know why he wrote that such a contradiction in general they are poorly educated have a lot of money to spend and all the imaginable occasions to indulge in vice thus there must be a large number of vicious people among them He's going to contradict himself later on, you know. This is a Protestant country. Is this even possible? Vicious people. Among them, the Protestants. England is a country based on liberty and impunity. Everyone can be who they choose to be. And there are, among the English, without any doubt, so many extraordinary characters and so many good as well as bad heroes. I think that he just wants to make a point. He wants to claim or even purport that England is a country based on liberty and impunity and that there are many extraordinary characters and that they can just be themselves. They're complete free. But why he said poorly educated, I really don't know because he's on the next slide, on the next excerpt, you're going to see he's going to contradict himself. Let's have a look. Freedom, liberty, and scientific production. Scientific production? Didn't you say they were poorly educated? Well, I must not forget to tell you that the English are good at science and that for a plethora of subjects there are competent writers among them. This did not surprise me, as they feel free and are at ease. They love using their brain and neglect sophisticated language. This focus on manners that diminishes the activity of the brain. This is very, very important because the French are always accused by the English and before them by Murald of using sophistica sophisticated language, lots of faffing around, lots of words instead of facts, of acts actually even. So that's that's going to be very important to understand Englishness and to compare England to France and also to Switzerland and see <clears throat> the similarities between the two Protestant countries. Protestant Switzerland, Switzerland is also Catholic, of course. We can't forget Lucerne and some cantons of central Switzerland and <clears throat> England. So here is going to is making his point again, freedom, liberty, scientific production, scientific production thanks to uh, uh, avoiding um, sophisticated language, um, getting to the point and also freedom because without freedom, without liberty, there can't be any scientific production. So he is not contradicting himself, but he says here that they are good at science, so they can't be poorly educated. At last, but not least, their language is rich and clear. A trifle is rarely disguised as a matter of importance. He's going to talk a lot about this, that a trifle is rarely disguised as a matter of importance. As far as sciences are concerned, they are a century ahead of the other nations. So, my dear friends, you see, they were not poorly educated. Okay, they were not poorly educated. He's contradicting himself here. They were not poorly educated. 
and a trifle is rarely distinguished as a matter of importance. If you read Lawrence Stern, you can see how he's accusing the French of hilarious examples that they transform a trifle into a matter of importance. In fact, in fact, for Murat has influenced not just Rousseau, not just Stern, but the whole 18th century. He was ever so important. I just have to stress that, yeah? And England, he's impressed. England is far ahead of the other nations. Let's have a look at the next slide. Here, and you see that James Gilray's portrait was not really out of context because here on the left you could see John Bull. Hey, John Bull. I love John Bull. Look at him. He's blunt. He definitely feeds on beef, on lots of beef. Just amazing. Amazing stereotype. And a metonymy of the English. So if you study Englishness, it's a good way, a funny way. Because, of course, it's very exaggerated to, to start your studies of English by John Bull. And yeah, write a few comments if you want some information about John Bull and I can send you some, some amazing stuff by some really good scholars. Um, the blunt country gentleman, closest to nature and restrained. Doesn't that characterise Rousseau? Closest to nature. Now we've got close to nature as well and restraint. Now you see why the English loved Rousseau so much until they started hating him when he came to England towards the end of, of, of his travels. But that's another story, isn't it? Not part of today's lesson, but nature, yeah, closest to nature. We've got that in Rousseau and we've already got it in Murat and restraint. Restraint, if you study Englishness, you will see restraint is so important. You, you know, nowadays, if you analyse English discourses, English speech even, restraint is just important. Yeah. Something very peculiar and that I think mo most distinguishes them from the other merchants is that after that they can afford some land, they leave their flourishing business to become country gentlemen. This means that among them there are men who are able to abandon their work and enjoy its fruits. They must have been living, leave it. Leave it no, sorry, this is badly read. Sorry, my friends. This must have been. They, I'm sorry. They must have been leaving in their droves, as there is a book in which the author, a merchant himself, complains about them and accuses them of destroying commerce. So they left their job in their droves. They were becoming financially independent, a buzzword in 2021, and then they just left. Well, impressive, yeah. So they wanted land. They wanted to buy land. Isn't that very modern? Bill Gates today, in 2021, is buying lands in the United States. So that's what they did. They left, well, also their, their stocks because there was, well, it's a bit early, yeah. South Sea Bubbles, no, no, we're getting there, South Sea Bubbles, so they left, they left their shares in the South Sea overseas and they, they, they sold their shares, they sold their pieces and they bought land, a bit like Bill Gates in 2021. And they wanted to be financially independent, to be close to nature and then they have got this restraint, you know, if you look at Bill Gates, an American of course, not an Englishman, but then we see a lot of parallels between 18th century England and America, just think of oh, Statue of Liberty, for example. Liberty is so important. And I mean, the whole American Revolution is linked to 17th, end of 17th, early 18th century Englishness. And Protestantism, of course. Okay, so let's have a look at the next slide. 
beef and aggressivity. So think if you think of beef, think of the well well nourished John Bull character. Beef and aggressivity. So we've got beef, hence the bull, John Bull, the stock type, and then the dog, the bulldog. Bulldog, bulls, beef, John Bull. And you're pretty advanced in the studies of Englishness if you study that. Roast beef, yeah. If you arrive in England on Sunday, have a roast dinner, Sunday roast, get into the spirit, go go out, go to the seaside, look at people walking their dogs, and you get into it. And here he wrote about Muad wrote about beef and aggressivity. Roast beef is the favourite dish of the king and the craftsmen alike. And still is in 2021, isn't it? It is not uncommon that the pieces of beef weigh 30 to 40 pounds, as it signifies English prosperity and abundance. Have I written that in my paper? Oh yeah, I have, yeah. But I did not know Murold at that time. So don't know, yeah, but that's just so true, isn't it? If you if you study English nowadays, then, then yeah, that, 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 this is a translation here, yeah, <laughs> of an excerpt. But yeah, you, you can read that in in, in, in nowadays in today's papers, yeah, that uh, English prosperity and abundance is linked to, to, to roast beef, like the animals which live in their country and following the examples of the fighting cock. The English are temerarious. Oh, yes, they are. Their dogs are the bravest and least loudmouthed animals in the world. And so are the people, aren't they? They do not bark or bite anyone. If they are asked to attach, sorry, if they are asked to attack someone, they fight till their death and always without any barking or groaning. So no faffing around, no talking, only acts. Sometimes we can observe that these dogs, after that they have broken their leg, still attack. If I dared, I would argue that for many aspects, the English resemble their dogs. What? What is he saying? Well, no, if I dared is right. So he's not doing it. He says, if I dared, I would argue that for many aspects the English resemble their dogs, but maybe he really thought that because he admired those dogs, weren't they the ones that still fought after their legs were broken? They were heroes! So you can't, especially in the 17th century, compare the English to dogs. We know how much the English loved their dogs nowadays, and probably even in the 17th century. And Rousseau preferred to be with his dog rather than go and visit the king because he was worried about, you know, something that something could happen to his dog. But you know, you you, you can't compare people to dogs. So if I dared, I would argue that for many aspects the English resembled their dogs. But here it's really a compliment. He is in awe. Both are close mouthed and stubborn. Oh, he is comparing them, then, yeah? If I dared, he's staring. Cockfights are rather amusing. The small animal's anger and tenaciousness and the cry of victory of the victorious cock who stands on top of the subjacent body are, I do not know why myself, extremely peculiar and entertaining. So peculiar and entertaining. Again, we've got this dog at Delectare, don't we? Now, we're going to compare the Frenchman to John Bull. So the bull, the bulldog, John Bull, the Englishman, and then the Frenchman. Here we've got a caricature of the macaroni. The macaronis are a phenomenon mainly of the 18th century, but as we are going to see in the 70, uh, in the next slide, um, in the 17th century, the macaroni exists. It just wasn't called the macaroni because macaroni, of course, is a grand tourist who came back from Italy. 
macaroni italy pasta yeah you understand that so 18th century they went to italy and here we talk about a frenchman 17th end of 17th century so he was not really a macaroni again a bit out of context but they were called monsieur in the 17th century or marquis and we're going to have a look at that next slide but here what is important that these were frenchmen and here we've got the macaroni and the butcher the butcher of course who is connected to the sturdy englishman who feeds on beef so the butcher character in fact before john bull in britain we had the butcher who was very important epitomized the english so the butcher character the man who feeds on beef and ale then john bull the bulldog the bull himself sometimes actually um, the symbol for Englishness was, of course, always Britannia for the whole of Britain. But for England, we've got the bull. And the bull really epitomizes the English and not the British because the Scottish were much poor and they were, were said to feed on oat, on porridge, while the rich English, they fed on beef. Well, it's all a bit of a myth, of course so <clears throat> please forgive me but if i do if i use these stereotypes but they did exist in the 17th century and the 18th century and we need to know them if we want to study englishness from the 17th century to, to brexit for example a frenchman is never going to be as tough as john bull as far as this topic is concerned a very peculiar event happened and the tragic comedy of it made the whole town laugh and here the town of course is london a frenchman who had been living for a long time in england and who believed that he had turned completely english when severely distressed decided to kill himself he chose you have to believe me that method of killing which is so fashionable here to the point that he cut himself with a razor blade but scared stiff at the first sight of his blood and abandoning his death wish, he rushed to his physicians. The doctors could not help him, and to the Englishman's great joy, he died in their arms. The English, who are swift in their methods and never blink, laugh joking about him. So here we see the difference between an Englishman and a tough Englishman, a bulldog, who still fights after his legs were broken and who would never go and die in his physician's arms. And if you're not English, then you have to understand that physician is a doctor. So he died in his doctor's arms. And the English loved joking about the Frenchman. Oh, we've got so, so, so many caricatures about the French at the end of the 17th and the 18th century by Rowlandson, mainly by James Gilray. Have a look at them online, they're hilarious. The labourers. So we had John Bull, the bulldog, the bull, and now the labourers. We hear in the lower orders, but look at the admiration Muald had for the English labourers. The English workforce has a well-established reputation in the whole world and with regards to many of their characteristics, rightly so, they excel in watchmaking, joinery, carpentry, making saddles and other things that I cannot recall at the moment. So not only all, but a lot of parallels. Isn't Switzerland famous for watchmaking and joinery, carpentry, making saddles? They're always also France is, is famous for joinery, carpentry and making saddles, but definitely the labourers were not as tough as the English. And then there is this parallel, Swiss watchmaking and English watchmaking at the end of the 17th century. The Englishman's vices, drinking, gambling and whoring at the end of the 17th century. This would not be acceptable in the 18th century 
although again we've got this caricature here by James Gilray on the left which is of course in the 18th century but it's not in England it's people who to indulge, indulge in the vices have to go abroad and you might recognize on the left you've got Lady Hamilton when she was <clears throat> in fact she's called Hamilton when she was married to William Hamilton who was working at the British Embassy in Naples he was not well he was called the envoy the British envoy a friend of the king who represented the king in Catholic Naples and here we've got Lady Hamilton naked entertaining her husband's guests this is actually all true so that is what happened and then Admiral Nelson traveled to Naples fell in love with her and after William Hamilton's death she became well her um, Nelson's stable lover and before she already was Nelson's lover so here we see that vices then in the 18th century happened abroad but in the 17th century when Murat when Murat traveled to England these vices were very diffused in England among all classes in the 18th century it's more the lower orders who indulge in gin drinking of course also the the, the upper classes middle class they there were vices there always are vices where there are human beings but not as much as in the 17th century the Englishman's most common pleasures are the consumption of wine whoring gambling in one word they indulge in vice as far as wine and women are concerned two vices that for the English come together they are not interested in quality nor do they seek approbation generally they are not quite tender I dare say that they do not just drink to get drunk they want that their horse get drunk too ah well very perspicacious he must have been indulging in wine whoring and gambling as well and by he I mean Muralto of course otherwise if he didn't go to those places how did he know okay so he even knew that they did not just drink to get drunk but that their horse were drunk too so probably went to see the horse I imagine otherwise how could he know that so all these vices and wine and whoring wine was not very well seen in Protestant England because it's still a very Catholic drink an expensive drink so if you drank wine you spend a lot of money and then gambling of course gambling wine whoring okay wine you spend a lot of money gambling you lose a lot of money whoring whoring you get illnesses venereal disease like the 18th century was very diffused but always seen as imported a bit like coronavirus which always was you know brought to England by those evil foreigners who came and let's close the borders you see so in the 18th century they accused always the foreign travelers and people who went on the grand tour for bringing home venereal disease this was never uh, an English disease but always a Catholic disease and here here you see the modernity as well that the Englishman's most common pleasures are the consumption of wine whoring gambling and he's saying that in the 18th century they did indulge in vice ale would not be seen as a vice as it nourished people well John Bull fed on beef and ale so ale no ale was not ale drinking was not a vice and even in Victorian times it was absolutely okay to go down to a pub have one or two pints then go home for an early night and work very well the next day it nourished you well it wouldn't cost much money so you see here a tradition in the 18th century that goes well into Victorian times now we go back to what I talked two slides earlier the macaroni an Englishman who on the Grand Tour who came back from mainly Italy and 
we see that the stock character, the Macaroni and the French fop, the Monsieur and the Marquis, they're all the same. So let's have to have a look at what Muralto thought about these, about the Catholic other, about these Macaroni, about his Frenchified fops, bows and other young Frenchified fops is the title that I gave to this excerpt that I have translated for you. Young men of quality mix and mingle among themselves. They normally meet at the chocolate shop, which in their opinion is less common and posher than the coffee houses. Among those which the English call beau, we can see a species of the French Marquis, but less clumsy and who do not want to attract by their intelligent speech, but merely by their appearance. It seems to me that they are not going to prosper in a country like this, in which common sense prevails. So England is a country where common sense prevails, while France, this is implicit, is not. So France is not a country where common sense prevails, but where appearance is important. And the French, the French Marquis, is also seen as clumsy. These Englishmen, who were a bit like the French Marquis, were at least, they were not clumsy. He says it here very clearly. Among those which the English call beau, we can see a species of the French Marquis, but less clumsy. So he's still not really condemning these people, these men, because they are English, they're not French, they are Protestant. So at least they are not clumsy. A clumsy man is not really what you want to see, is it? So they were not clumsy. Young men of quality mix and mingle among themselves. So they're a bit of a group apart and they do not meet in which I'm going to tell you the posh coffee houses because coffee houses were quite posh. They were not the pubs, they were the coffee houses, but they were not posh enough for these young Frenchified fops. They went to a chocolate shop. Have you ever heard of the 17th century chocolate shop? Very honestly, I haven't. But Muralto, he went to England, he travelled to England. He's our ambassador and he's telling us that they went to a chocolate shop. I've studied a lot on the pub in the 17th and 18th century and on the various coffee houses, Wicks who met in coffee houses, the Tories who met in coffee houses, the people who discussed the, 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 um, the South Sea Bubble in the other coffee house, but chocolate shop? I have to admit, I haven't heard much about the 17th century chocolate shop. So yeah, we would have to, I would have to look that up. The um, the English chocolate shop in the 17th century that might be very very interesting. Back in Switzerland, okay, he's traveling here. Back to Switzerland here, we've got William Parr, Glacier du Rhone, on the left. Beautiful, isn't it? Back in Switzerland, you have seen me, sir, back from my travels, and you share my happiness. If our travels make us achieve considerable things, and if relaxation to be sweet has to follow hard work, it is to the countryside that we must escape. Exactly like John Bull. Didn't the rich merchants sell everything and go back to the countryside? So John Bull is a model for us. Murat is in awe of, of the English in England. Life in the cities has too tumultuous a character. I see that only the countryside takes us back to our natural state. That's what Rousseau is going to teach us. Go back to nature. Walk in nature. Nature frees us from dependence and gives us back our liberty, without which we cannot live happily. Here our habits sweeten and our passions calm themselves. The scope of our projects diminishes and our life gets simple. Murat's legacy. The French scholar Claude Brunetot in Beat Louis de Murat et l'Angleterre argues that many writers like Voltaire and Prévost who travelled to England followed Murat's footsteps. The Swiss philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau was influenced by Murat. Rousseau's journals contain notes on Murat's Lettres sur les Anglais et les Français. 
Brunetto shows that the character of Milord Edward Bromston in Rousseau's novel Julie or The New Heloise is propounding Murald's idea. And this book was very, very important in the 18th century. 18th century grand tourists who travelled to Switzerland always travelled with Julie. Julie or La Nouelle Héloïse. And then they went to see the places that were mentioned in Julie. So again, a kind of tourism that looks at monuments and not at people. I think that Murad would not have been happy and Rousseau neither. But, you know, Julie is much more than these places. Just the tourists looked at those places in the Valais, on uh, the Peter Island, Neuchâtel. So the places also were where... <clears throat> where Rousseau went to live and took refuge. Now let's go on. This is be, be, uh, pretty much my own conclusion here. The first part, of course, is more what Bruno Dor says. And you've got all the quotes here. So this is um, Claude Bruno Dor's work, Beat Louis de Muralt et l'Angleterre. Please have a look at that. It's very, very well written and it's very interesting as well and inspired my work. So here, Claude Brunetot and some conclusions of mine. There are many parallels between Muralt and Rousseau. Their passion for the myth of a superior Ur Switzerland, based on liberty, independence, walking, closest to nature and direct democracy. Their hang for frugality, understatement and bluntness, and the idea that everyone was against them. All this eventually led to a retired life, paranoia and misanthropy. Les lettres sur les Anglais et les Français show that there are many parallels between English exceptionalism and Swiss exceptionalism, both based on the Protestant ethos. And I think that's very, very important to understand why Switzerland did not want to join the European Union. Swiss is part of the Schengen Agreement, but not the European Union. And England, of course, we know now. I am here speaking in May 2021, where it has opted for Brexit, unfortunately, I would say. But it's not about, you know, condemning Brexit or anything. It's about understanding why we've got Brexit, why Switzerland does not want to be part of the European Union. So William Tell. And this decision of not being part of Switzerland are very much linked to Switzerland and Protestantism and the fact that they are both Protestant countries. And, you know, this, this, this is important to understand. John Paul is very much Mr. Brexit. And in fact, if you look at Nigel Farage, you could see how he is. He is, definitely is a John Paul character. At least he performs a John Paul character. I mean, in public, you can always see him with a pint of ale, but in private, we know that he li likes wine. Well, anyway, the newspaper said so. Whenever I met him, he was sticking to ale. And I can assure you that on any flight, he was always drinking tea, never coffee, and always paying cash in pounds sterling, never in euro. Well, <laughs> to have a bit of fun as well here. No, um, I, can, I can tell you that this English exceptionalism and Swiss exceptionalism, these parallels are very important if you want to study the parallels between Switzerland and England in the 18th century, but also now in these gloomy times of Brexit and Switzerland, who just does not want to join the European Union and then the bilateral way that now they are still discussing, aren't they, what kind of relationship there's going to be, because Brexit now happened, and we're going to see, well, it's not that it's happened, it's finished, it's happened, it started, and this is also still has to come, I think, maybe, I don't know, but 6th of May just been four days ago, we see that Scotland, there could be a second referendum, so Scotland could leave the UK, so it's still a lot is going to happen. Brexit has just been voted for, but a still of consequences come, and Switzerland out of the European Union being at the heart of Europe as a continent, but out of the European Union, is that going to go well? Well, I'm very negative, but I leave that there. Here, what we want to see is this parallels and this friendship 
between Switzerland and Britain. So here we've got these two pictures, Switzerland, the sublime mountains, and these people who really adore uh, retired life, nature, all the instruments, the Swiss flag, they celebrate the Swiss flag. There's no flag of the European Union. They will hate that, wouldn't they? To have to have two flags would be difficult to, 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 to swing two flags at the same time, a Swiss and European one. But where Swiss solidarity, well, just leave it there, yeah? And then here we have this girl looking at departures and European Union and Brexit. And if she's from the European Union, she's now only allowed to stay for three months. And if she wants to stay any longer, well, she might, if she's very wealthy, apply for a tourist visa or um, she would have to get herself a job that pays more than £2,000, which is not easy, out of London. And then London's very expensive for her. So she's kind of looking at all these departures and you've got European Union and you've got Brexit, very, very sad image. You've got on the left um, a guy again looking at these flights, not really understanding where you should go and which exit. And well, it's too early to say what kind of disaster we go into. And there's this couple on the left kissing. Maybe it's goodbye because one of them only can stay for three months per year no, per, uh, out of six months isn't it in Britain so very very sad picture here there is even on the left a uh, screen that does not work of course this was well, this this work was done before coronavirus but maybe it's just down because of coronavirus but also because people don't know where to go how long they can stay if they should say goodbye to their family if they're not British or if the family can come on the continent, so a real disaster. And to understand all that, we go back to our friend Murald. Murald's prophecy, Anglo-Swiss exceptionalism and hard borders. So that's really his sad prophecy, isn't it? But Switzerland and England, they're always going to be friends. They were, they had such a close relationship in the 17th century and they still have nowadays. Here we've got bibliography. Please have a look at this. This is amazing work. Of course, we've got Les Lettres sur les Anglais et les Français. You can read them for free. They're fully available online, Lettres sur les Anglais et les Français, or the longer version, Lettres sur les Anglais, les Français et les Voyages. Enjoy. Then we've got Bruneto Claude, Béat Louis de Muralt, et l'Angleterre. This is in French published on the Revue de la Société d'études anglo-américaines des 17e et 18e siècles. Amazing! If you know French, enjoy! Really, really good! Still, you need to know French to read Pitassi Maria Cristina, an amazing scholar, really love her. Genève et le piétisme au tournant des siècles 17 et 18. Et le cas de Beat de Muralt, she's also writing on Turettini. Another Protestant who traveled to England, amazing. Maria Christina Pitassi, please, if you know French, read her. Reich Le Claude, Le, repatri le Rapatriement des Différences. Beat Louis Ludwig de Muralt Entre Deux Mondes. You can find this La Rivista di Literature Moderne e Comparate in French, though. Et des Différences. This must be very, very European. Eh? You've got a French title by Claude Reichler, first name, French first name, as a fa a German family name. So I do not know this color at all, but that sounds very, very good, doesn't it? And then published on the Rivista di Letterature Moderne Comparate. Definitely very good, although I do not know him personally. Uh, Claude Bruneto, I have read a lot by him and know him as a scholar by reading him very well. The same is true for Maria Cristina Pitassi. I've read a lot, a lot of um, contributions by her. Amazing. I can recommend this. And thank you very, very much for your attention. Thank you for staying with me until the very bitter end. I really appreciate that. My channel is going to grow. If you watch 
my videos until the end if you give it a like if you feel like giving it a like i don't know if it deserves one that's entirely up to you but if you want to enjoy more of this kind of content then please subscribe to my channel and you're really going to help me and help my work and my project my part of a, of this large project of anglo-swiss friendship has not been financed yet financement has not been confirmed so please help my channel thank you very much my friends